Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the GRE, the third edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today, we'll solve problems starting from page number 131 131 bottom of the page on page 131 problem number 5 problem number 5 and these problems that we are about to solve are the exact same problems that already appeared in the previous editions the first edition and the second edition if you're interested in watching the same problems being solved at a slower pace at a, at a much slower pace you will find the solutions to all the problems that we are about to do today from day number 21 through 24. Just type in GRE math day 21 and all the way up to 24, 21, 22, 23 and 24. The problems that we did on those four days are, are, are the ones that we're going to do today in this video. Number 5, page 131. Page 131, number 5. And the problem that we're about to do, number 5, it says A takes 10 minutes to do a job, to do a job. We are further told that B takes 15 minutes to do the same job. The question simply is, how long together? Okay, I hope that you have the book in front of you. In the book, of course, the question is going to go on to say, how long will they take working together at their simultaneous, at their respective simultaneous pace, respective, uh, respective pace, not simultaneous. Do you understand? How long will they take working together at their respective constant pace? We're not going to write all of that. Do you understand? So, question simply is, these are called, these are called work time problems. And they appear all the time in the exam. They appear all the time and sometimes people have trouble with them, particularly if there are more than two actors in it. If you want to get some more practice on the work time problems, listen very carefully, on my channel, other than the GRE, GRE series, on my channel you're going to find a separate series simply titled Basic Math. That's it, just Basic Math. And on that, uh, in that series you will find practice problems that will help you improve your skill as far as the work time problems are concerned. There are 15 videos. Day 111 through 115, those are easy questions. The next five are day 131 through 135, the medium one. And finally, the last five videos in the series, the series has 200 videos. Day 196 through 200, work time problems, which are, of course, far more difficult than the, than the, than the first five. You, you don't have to watch all 15 of them. If watch, watch the first five, at least, and what maybe watch easy and a medium one and make sure that at least you can do those and if you want to get a decent score if you want to get a really high score then of course you have to be prepared to answer even the hardest question on the, on the, on, on the exam enough of the talk we have two machines one takes 10 minutes one takes 15 minutes how long will they take together or how long will they take working together but the trick here trick here is to find there trick here here's the solution trick here is to find their LCM. Find their LCM, the least common multiplier of 10 and 15. 10 and 15. Let's find them, shall we? Divide by 5 and you get 2 and 3 and you're done. The smallest number, LCM, is so called because it is the smallest number, the least number. It is the smallest number that happens to be a multiple of both 10 and 15. We could have used 60 here. 60 is the multiple of 10 and 15. We could have used we could have used 120. 120 is a multiple of 10 and 15, and we could have used 120 trillion. But the higher the number, more work you'll end up doing. So the smallest number that we can find that we can find that happens to be multiple of both 10 and 15 is right here. 5 times 2 is 10, 10 times 3 is 30. 30 is a multiple of 10 and 30 is a multiple of 15. Let them work. Let them work. Let them work for 30 minutes and see what happens. In 30 minutes, in 30 minutes, A will do how many jobs? 
they will do how many jobs? We know it takes 10 minutes to do a job. Well, if he takes 10 minutes to do a job, one job, if you may let him work 30 minutes, he's able to do three jobs. And in 30 minutes, and in 30 minutes, B will do how many jobs? Well, we know B takes 15 minutes to do the job. Well, if B can finish the job in 15 minutes, and if you let him work for half an hour, he'll be able to do two jobs. What do we find? What we find is that together, together, they can do, they can do five jobs. That's a five. Together they can do five jobs. Two plus three. Five jobs in how long? In 30 minutes. In 30 minutes. That's it. We're done. All done. All done. Five jobs in 30 minutes. Five jobs in 30 minutes. And obviously, if they only have to do one job, one job they should be able to do in 30 divided by 5 in 6 minutes. That's it. The question was, how long will they take them? How long will they take to do the job together? The answer is 6 minutes. Don't do it the way they show in the book. My God. Don't do it the way they do it in the book. That's a, that's a, that's a quite hellish way. Don't do, it, don't do it that way. And as I said, if you, need, if you want to get some more practice, at least watch the first five, 11, 111 through 115. Just type in basic math, day 111. Take, do the problem yourself and then pause the video, do the problem and then compare your work. Let's go to the next one. On the next page, we have three problems dealing with percentages. Dealing with percentages. And they give you the table which is on the bottom of page 132. I'm not going to put the table. I'm not going to put the table in the blackboard. I'm assuming that you have the book in front of you. You must have, if you're going to work with me every time that you turn on the, the turn, turn this video on, you must have the book in front of you. Even if I forget to remind you that. So here we go. We are on page number 133. So we have store P, we are told, for store P, we are told that in 2006, the sales were $800,000. Sales were $800,000. For 2008, for the same store, store P, the question is, what is their sales? But we know, if you look at the table carefully, for store P, the very first uh, row, the store P, we know that the sales of the store, store P, went up by 10% from 2006 to 2007. From, from 2006, 2007 the sales went up by sales went up by 10 percent and if you keep reading further the next column they tell us that from from 2007 to 2008 the sales went down by 10 percent well if they went up by 10 percent and then they went down by 10 percent then of course it's eight hundred thousand dollars no that is not the case of course that will be a silly thing to do. That will be a damn silly thing to do. So here's what we do. We have three years. 2006, which was a starting point. 2007 and 2008. The key here is to make sure that you do not use the figure that they give you. That will make complications. That will make complications quite hellish. It will be very time consuming. Pretend. Not pretend. Start with a base of 100. We're dealing with percentages. Start with 100. That's your 100%. Sales in 2006, whatever the sales were in the 2006, take 100% of that amount. 100, that's your starting point. What do you suppose is going to happen in 2007 if you start out with 100? Well, from 2006 to 2007, it went up by 10%. Well, that's very easy. It went up by 10%, 100 will become 110. That's the increase of, increase of 10%. Now, here's a tricky part. From 2007 to 2008, there is a drop of 10%. A drop of 10%, but drop of 10% of what? That's the key. When we go from 2007 to 2008, the base is no longer 100. Our point of reference is no longer 100. When we go from 2000 and 2007 to 2008, and we say that we had a drop of 10%, 10% of what? 10% of the initial amount, the initial amount that we started out with in 2007. 10% of 2007, 10 of 110 is 11. So in 2008, we will have 110 minus 11. 
That's, that represents the 10%. That represents the drop of 10%. 110 minus 11 is 99. In other words, if you start out with $100 and you increase it by 10% one year and then drop it by another 10% the following year, you will end up with 99% of the initial amount. 99% of the initial amount. All we have to do now is to figure out what is 99% of this amount. That's very easy. That's very easy. Very easy, very straightforward. We had $800,000. That's the 100%. And therefore, 1% of 800 is 8. We subtract 1% and we'll end up with 99%. 800 minus 8 is $792,000. That's your answer. The sales will be $792,000. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Number two. Number two. Same page, I believe. Yes, same page. Now we are in store T. We are at store T. This is number two. And now we are dealing with store T, not store T. Question is, for store T, sell, sales for 2007 was what percent of the amount for 2008. Store T, again look at the table and look at the store T which is the very last column and store T from 2007 to 2008 from 2007 to 2008 but they do not give us any dollar figures they do not give us any dollar figure but they do tell us they, they do tell us that there was a drop there was a drop of 8% from 2007 to 2008 look at the table and you will see it Look at the table. In the very last row, it tells us that from 2007 to 2008, we had a drop of 8%. And that is enough for us to figure out what they're asking for. So let's pretend that 2007, let's pretend that 2007, I'm going to change the color. Let's pretend that 2007 was $100. That's for 2007. And there was a drop of 8%. If it's a drop of 8%, if you start out with 100, you should end up with 92. And now we can answer the question. For store T, for store T, sales for 2007, well, we just found out the sales for, two, oh, we, we, we are pretending sales for 2007 is 100. So sales for 2007, which we are, which we are working with, 100. 100 was what percentage of, or rather, in this case, we will say 100 is, 100 is what percentage of the amount for 2008? Amount for 2008 is 92. There you go. There is the question. This is what we're looking for. Question is very simple. The question simply is 100 is what percent of 92? And don't pick 8. 8 is a sucker answer. You understand? Let's do it together, shall we? We don't need this anymore. So we're simply going to take that statement. We are simply going to take that statement and convert it into an equation. Let's begin. 100, 100 is, is means equal. What, what means, what is the unknown? Percent means over 100. 7% means 7 over 100. 33% means 33 over 100. X, this is the unknown part, quantity, the X, X percent over 100 x over 100, off means times, times what? Times 92. This is the equation we have to solve for. This is the equation we have to solve for. Do not reach for calculator, okay? For Christ's sake, do not reach for calculator. This is practice. You want to improve your skills. You want to do it manually. It will help you 
improve your math skill. Just multiply both sides by 100. If you multiply both sides by 100, we'll end up with 100 times 100. 100 times 100 equals 92x. Let's divide both sides by 92 and we'll find that x equals 100 times 100 is 10,000 divided by 92. 10,000 divided by 92 is what we're going to look for and question is asking us to find this answer to the nearest 0.1 of a percent. To, to nearest 0.1 percent. All of this is important. We have to pay attention to all of that. Otherwise, you will not get any credit. All we have to do is divide 10,000 by 92. Let's do it. We're going to divide 10,000 by 92 right here, right now. 10,000. That's 100,000. 10,000. 10,000 by 92. How did I catch myself that that was wrong? Because 10, we, we, we're multiplying 100 by 100, we should have four zeros, not five. Now that's 10,000, and I'm writing 100 like this for a reason. We're going to divide by 92. How many 92 does 100 have? 100 has 192. We have a remainder of 8. We drop a 0. 80 has, 80 has no 92. 80 doesn't have any 92. So we drop another 0. And remember, we have the final answer that we're going to get is going to be in percentage because this is how we set it up. This is what's, what's appearing here is a percentage. Now we know 800 has 8100. 800 has 8100. Therefore, it must have 892 at least. So let's do it by 8 and figure out what 92 times 8 is. 8 2 is 16, 6 carry 1, 9 8 is 6, 72 plus 1 is 73. We're going to get 4 here, 9 minus 3 is 6, and then we get half a 0. And again, 640 has 6100, therefore it should have 692. It should have 692. So this 0 came down, this 0 came down. Now this 0 that we introduced, this is very hard to pay attention. Okay. We had a remainder of 8. When we brought this 0 down, this 0 was this right here. And when we brought this zero down, this is comes down right here. We have no more zeros here. We have used it up. So this zero that we introduce is going to have a decimal. We introduce a decimal and we introduce a zero here. Let's figure out what 92 times 6 is. 12, carry 1. 9, 9 6 is 54. Or 6 9 is 54. 9 6 is 54. How do I know that 9 6 is 54? Because I know 10 6 is 10 6 is 60. If I have 10 6, it's 60, so 9 must be 54. 54 plus 1 is 55. We're going to get 8. 13 minus 5 is 8. And we're going to get... Watch what happens now. Watch what happens. Oh, I never put the 6 up there. So this, this represents... This, rep this amount represents a 6. And now we have 888, 880. Which will have at least 8. Doesn't mean... This will have at least 8, because 8 times 100 is 800. It will have at least 8, at least 8, and whatever that is, we don't, we are not interested in it. Listen very carefully. Whatever the 8 times 92, we don't, we, we are not interested in it. We simply have to realize that whatever this figure is here, because it's such a large amount, whatever it is, is more than 5. It's more than 5. And since we are looking for the nearest 0.1%, we are done. Our work is done. The nearest 0.1%, the answer is 108 point, point 6, and this is more than 5, this is more than 5, so if you want to the nearest 0.1%, it's going to be 108.7. That's it. That's the answer to question number 2. It's 108.7%, because that's what they want. They don't want to the nearest tenth, uh, nearest uh, 100, or near of a, nearest thousandth of a percent. They want they want it to the nearest one-tenth of a percent. We just did it. Let's do problem number three. Problem number three. Problem number three says, which of the following statement must be true? Must be true. 
statement A says, for 2008, R has the highest sales. Is it true? Look at the table there. Look at the table and tell me, does the store R have the highest sales in 2008? Well, we know from 2007 to 2008, the store P had a drop of 10%, the store Q had an increase of 9%, the store R had an increase of 12%, and the other two stores had a drop. So in terms of percentage, the store, the store R did, did indeed have, did indeed have highest percentage increase in sales. But highest percentage increase does not mean that it has the highest sales unless we know the dollar amount. We have no dollar figures. So it did have the greatest increase in percentage, but what was the base? We cannot tell. Maybe one store had a sales of $100, the other store had a sales of million dollars. So even if it has an increase of 15%, that doesn't necessarily mean that it has the highest sales. There are no dollar figures. There are, there are, there are no dollar figures. And therefore, this statement is false. Aha! Is it? Is this statement false? No. The answer to that question is no. Or we cannot make that claim. We cannot make that claim. To say that it is false, is false. What we should have said is that that statement is not, not, necessarily true. This statement is not necessarily true. It may be true. We don't know the figures for, for dollar figures for this store or for that matter for any other stores. We need to know the dollar figures for all the stores before we can ascertain that this store indeed have the highest sales. Do you understand? Before we can ascertain that this store did indeed have highest sales. So it may be true, it may not be true. We cannot, we cannot make a claim. All we can say is that it is not necessarily true. It may be true, it may not be true. But since we are being asked to establish something that has to be true, that must be true, therefore we cannot pick it. It is not something, it is not something that must be true. It may be true. Statement two. Statement number two. Did we ever learn this word ascertain? Did we ever learn this word in the vocabulary lessons? Should we find out? Oh, there we go. Day number 85. What do you know? Vocab day 85. If you're interested in improving your vocabulary, just type in GRE vocabulary words, day 85, and you will learn this word along with some other useful words. Statement number B. Statement B says, the sales the store sales at S for 2008 was 22% less than for 2006. Well, here is our 2006, here is our 2007, here is our 2008. And if you look at store S in the, in the chart, if you look at the stores S, which is the second to the last row, the penultimate row, you will see that if you, if you pretend that the figures for 2006 is 100, we are told that it had a drop of 7%. It had a drop of 7%. Drop of 7%. If a drop of 7% becomes 93. And then we are told that it had an increase of, or then we had another drop, another drop of, 15%. Then we had the other drop of 15%. So now we have 85% of 93 here. But that is not the point. We're not going to waste our time to figure out what 85%. Why 85%? Because if it drops by 15%, what is left is 85%. 85% of what? 85% of this figure. But we're not going to waste our time figuring it out here. What we need to understand is that a drop of 7% and then on the drop of 15% does not mean cumulative drop of 22%. I'm not going to write everything on the blackboard. I'm going to say it one more time, slowly. A drop of 7% and a further drop of 15% does not mean, does not mean, this time it is definitely false. 
we, it's not something that's not necessarily true. It is false. A drop of 7% and another drop of 15% does not mean a cumulative drop of 22%. Cumulative drop is something going to be more than 22%. Oh, sorry, because it's going to be something less than 22%. Because when we drop by 7%, it becomes 93. And now we're taking 85% of not 100, but we're taking 85% of 93. So the cumulative drop is, is going to be something less than 22%. This is wrong. It is wrong. It's like saying it's like saying that uh, it's like saying that I had an enrollment in my school. There were 100 kids in year one, and then there was a drop of 50 percent from year one to year two. A drop of 50 percent, and then from year two to year three, it dropped by another 50 percent. Well, if it drops by 50 percent one year and it drops another 50 percent the following year, that does not mean that I have no kids left in my school. Why? Because a drop of 50 percent. From year one, from year one to year two, makes it 50. And now we take 50 percent. Now we take 50 percent off, not 100, but 50 percent of the previous figure. It becomes 25. A drop of 50 percent and another drop of 50 percent does not mean a cumulative drop of 100 percent. It doesn't disappear. Let's do statement C. You don't have to actually, actually have to do any calculations. Statement C says, for store R sales at R for 2008 was more than 17% greater than 2006. Well, let's find out, shall we? So here we're dealing with store R. Here is 2006. Here is 2007. Here is 2008. And what happens here? Let's look at the let's look at the chart one more time. You have to you have to have the book in front of you. For store R, we are told that it goes from 2006 to 2007. It goes up by five percent. So if you were to start with 100, it increases by five percent. Oh, it's going to become 105. And then. From 2007 to 2008, for store R, it increases by 12%. Again, an increase of an increase of 5%, and then another increase, a further increase of 12%. An increase of 5% and another increase of 12% does not mean cumulative increase of 17% actual increase, the cumulative increase is going to be more than 17%. Why? Because 12% of what? It goes up by 12% from 2007 to 2008, but 12% of what? It is not 12% of 100. It is going to be 12% of the previous figure, 105. And by the time you take 12% of 105, 12% 12 of 105 is going to be Twelve percent of one hundred and five is going to be more than one hundred and seventeen. It's going to be more than one hundred and seventeen, or rather, more on more one hundred and twelve. It's going to be more than one hundred and twelve. So first, it became one hundred and five. It was one hundred and five in two thousand seven. Twelve percent of I meant to say more than twelve. Twelve percent of 105 is more than 12. So the final sale for 2008 is going to be 105 plus something more than 12. It's going to be something more than 17%. The cumulative sales for this store from 2006 to 2008 is going to be more than 17%, not 17%. And what did the statement say? It says sales for store hours for 2008 was, oh, was more than one more than 17 percent. Well, in that case, that statement is true. C is correct because that's what C is saying. C is saying that sales for store R for 2008 was more than 17 percent greater than what it was in 2006, and that is correct. What it is, we're not going to worry about it. We, we don't need to need that. Do you understand? I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye now.